we are live. Welcome to this month's Speakeasy Live. My guest today is a mindset and performance coach working with senior leaders at the highest levels within the corporate world. I follow him on LinkedIn where I get access to his ideas and his thoughts, I don't know, a couple of times a week. And Philip Brady and I have been friends now for a couple of years. We have met in person just once. Such is the power of social media and digital and online platforms that you can cultivate a friendship and an acquaintance without ever meeting in person. Although I must say, Philip, I am looking forward to the next opportunity where we get to sit down face to face and have a chin wag. So over recent times, Philip and I have been chatting and we've been looking at ways that we can potentially collaborate and bring some ideas together because I think we share a lot of the same interests, a lot of the same values. It's my firm belief that everybody can feel fulfilled at work by knowing who they are so that they can show up and make their voice heard. And the reason why I'm connected to Philip and the reason why I follow him is that I see a lot of those same ideas coming through in his work. So let me just get started with a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the conversation. Can I please remind you all that are watching us today that if you'd like to ask any questions, you've got the opportunity now. Philip is with me for the next 30 minutes. So if you've got any questions, anything that you'd like to explore further, or if he says anything that makes you curious, please do use the chat. Drop your questions into the chat. I will be monitoring the chat. I will be keeping an eye. And if you've got anything you want to ask, I'll do my very best to make sure that Philip gets to hear your questions. Um, in order to do that, you do need to be subscribed to our YouTube channel. So hit subscribe and that will give you access to the chat. As a subscriber, you get access to our ideas, to our monthly Speakeasy Live, to top tips and I suppose concepts that will help you to communicate with impact at work. That's our promise to you. No junk, no rubbish, simple, straightforward advice that we hope will help you on your life's journey. So Philip, before we, I suppose, get into our, um, our chat now, what I'd love to talk to you about is a little bit about your own background. We discovered when we first met that we both come from the same town, Navan in County Meath, although I would say that uh, maybe we're a few years apart. Um, we both live now in Northern Ireland, albeit you're more of a city boy than I am. I'm living on the beautiful North Coast and you are in Belfast. I know that you studied finance. I know that you started out life as a retail banker. And I would love to know how this journey into performance coaching came about. Yeah, awesome. And Camilla, just thank you uh, for having me. And again, thanks for being part of my journey too. So it's an honor to be on a conversation like this too. So maybe just to get my housekeeping out of order as well and just say thank you, it's an honor. Uh, the journey is really uh, in 2000, so long before I was a working man or uh, even in college, my mother gave me a Tony Robbins book. So I was about 12 or 13 and uh, it changed my life, but it also changed somebody really close to me because the year after uh, I was having a conversation with somebody really close to me who was suicidal and they said something and I just reframed it with a question just shifted their attention to something different and a possibility. And ever since then, the difference I was able to make then, I just thought if I can do it for one, I wanna do it for as many as I can. So 13 years later, I'd saved up money while working and qualified as a coach, uh, joined uh, a large financial institution the year after and um, influenced my way into, despite working at technology initially, influenced my way into being able to coach on some of their most senior leadership programs. So three times a year while working in technology, I coached directors, managing directors, leading large groups of people, but also large businesses. And I then kind of took over managing all of our leadership programs in the region. So the Europe, Middle East and Africa, while also delivering and coaching on those programs as well. So just an honor, an absolute honor. And then since then, I've been working as a kind of, you could say like a strategic advisor on talent, learning and diversity to leadership teams across a number of different groups and a couple of different locations in the Europe, at least in Africa then as well, particularly Belfast and Dublin sites, but as well as that, that kind of regional group for a couple of the other kind of uh, product lines uh, within uh, the corporate world that I'm working in. Um, so that's some of it. And then personally, outside of that kind of corporate lens, I just care deeply about potential. I care deeply about people and just mirroring back to them who they could be and who they already are and removing some of the dust uh, and dirt that um, just takes that kind of brightness away 
Uh, we all have it in us, um, and I'm excited to help people along the way to see more of that. Um, and then I just read. I go to courses all the time. I'm in London at the end of next month on conferences and stuff like that. And I deliver talks and uh, coaching sessions uh, as often as I can while working full time too. So my days are busy. Uh, we're going to talk about stress and overwhelm, uh, and I live it. Uh, and I have learned some tactics along the way, probably just to help me be able to handle and thrive uh, despite the chaos and the overwhelm. So that's probably a bit of a background. My word, I certainly wasn't expecting that. Um, your mother, obviously very forward thinking, giving a 12 year old child a Tony Robbins book. And um, well, she must have known you very well. I mean, I have two boys of my own and um, well, to hand a 12 year old child a tome of that nature, certainly um, <laughs> she must have known her audience. But for it to have had such an impact on somebody so close to you at such a young age, that's got to have been a little bit of a life-changing moment that's got to have been a light bulb moment for you for you to see that actually this stuff works it works and that's why it's in my bones camilla and if i'm really honest up until april last year when i set up and really kind of kicked off my coaching business i had been playing small but that fire in my belly was eating me up and i needed to do something about it so now i'm choosing to play a little bit brighter like and uh, the people that I get to support day to day. So now it's time. Um, and I have a quote on my wall beside me that says, imagine if you met the person that you could have been. Um, that's a good motivator for me. So now it's time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great to see that you're taking all of the um, work that you've done within the workplace and taking that out to a wider audience. I mean, let's face it. You've talked to me about working within um, a finance environment, without work, about working within a banking environment, about working within technology. And I'm not sure how what length your career spans, but there is no question that knowledge work today has become incredibly complex. I think the pace of change, even in the last five years, uh, I, five years ago I was saying I can't cope with the pace of change, but in the last five years, never mind, the events of the last two years but we're, we're expected to deal with so much more i mean there's an external environment out there that's changing all the time and we have no control over it who two years ago could have possibly predicted the pandemic that we've all just been living through perhaps unless you're bill gates maybe or um, um, some folks in, in those types of circles we never know what the world is going to throw at us and then there's all of that external environment that's a little bit closer to us. We go into work and let's face it, there are colleagues who you don't like. <laughs> there are people that we have to deal with who we just cannot stand, that we don't get on with. There are clients who are extremely demanding. And then within our family lives, there are we may have caring responsibilities. We maybe are, are responsible for somebody else, so we need to look out for other people in our family. There is a lot going on for people nowadays regardless of what the nature of their work is but it seems as though working in some kind of a knowledge-based job the complexity of that is becoming more difficult for people to manage and yet in spite of all that you know we're resilient we bounce back from challenges and really when it comes down to it all that any of us really want is to have a little bit of influence over those around us a little bit of influence over how we live our lives how we choose to spend our day we really all want to make our voice heard and I'm picking up from you and from the way that you've set up this call or the way that we've opened this conversation is that you're working with people on a daily basis to help them to do just that yeah and, and I think it's interesting as well though that you said about bouncing back and I think what, one of the things that, that we forget is we've already probably overcome some of these things in the past and we yet have short-term memory about our successes and the good. So often it's just a reminding of like, what are you proud of? What have you already achieved? And that dramatically shifts your um, attention on your capability and makes you feel a little bit more resourced or resourceful knowing that it's not just a new version of you today showing up to solve these problems, but actually you have weight behind you uh, that will equip you as you move forward as well. But the second part to that almost as well is uh, when we're already overwhelmed, when our days are already so busy, when there's so much in it and your to-do list is ever expanding, 
And again, a lot of the leaders that I work with, this is their reality. A lot of the business owners who are either starting out and are overwhelmed by the abundance of things they could do, and also the business owners who are now managing people, that to-do list uh, grows and feels overwhelming. And if growth is more, which is how we typically uh, frame it, sometimes the reframe that I offer people is growth can also be things that you will let go of. So it can be things that you used to do. It can be things like who you were, maybe different aspects of what you held on to. Sometimes it's people and networks of people that you need to grow out of or past or at least transcend. And that, again, makes a big difference in how we cope with overwhelm. But typically there's four things you can uh, control because you said about the external environment out of our control. There are four things in your control. And if there's any, like I'm happy to be wrong about everything I say. One is physiology. Physiology is not just, am I fit? Am I mobile? Am I able to move? But it's your emotions. It's your breathing. It's your how you're standing. Like I'm standing, Camilla, it looks like you are. I know you said that you were sitting. But again, if I stand like this versus if I'm hunched and arms folded, my physiology changes. We've talked before about heart rate variability. I wear an aura ring to track my heart rate. And again, we can talk about the difference between being in a stressed state when overwhelmed or a resourceful or coherent state. And the bridge between the, the two is breathing. So getting a, 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 a hold on your physiology is one of the first things you can do to control. When you do that, you change how you feel. And the feeling is just the label for the emotion that you feel. So overwhelm, it's probably not an emotion. It's probably fear. But fear, again, is an embodied response. So how can we move you into more, a more resourceful state? There's different ways to do that. One is breathing. One is changing your body. But then the other three things out of that four is the language you use to describe the situation. Are you overwhelmed or are you really busy but so capable of doing the work? Right? Uh, all of these kind of things. How are you getting on? Oh, I'm crazy busy. I'm too busy. There's lots going on. That's how people typically describe their days. What if it was a, a, my day is full of things that I get to do. I don't have to. Nobody has to do anything. Really. You don't have to do anything. There will always be problems, though. And the problems that you meet when you stay in and hide are very different. And they're a little bit more uh, kind of soul uh, challenging than some of the challenges that we've chosen, we just forget that we've chosen or that we get to do these things. Sometimes it's an honor having these problems, but we forget, we look at our list of, no, I have to do this. You don't have to do anything. So taking that kind of label off some of these things can make a difference too. The third is what you focus on. Are you focused on a massive to-do list or on the next thing? And when you narrow it down from all to just the next step, that can make a big difference. What's in your control, what's out of your control? Typically, what's out of our control, including other people, gets our focus and our energy, and that takes so much out of us. Instead, again, it's redirecting towards what's in your control. So focusing on that and taking power or taking control and choosing to focus on that is the next one. And then the meaning that we give the thing. If you're overwhelmed, maybe you're capable of it, or maybe you're not. The same thing can have the two different meanings and would mean that we feel very differently about the same thing. So I think that that's some of the things, but also physically, starting off with physically, if you're overwhelmed, if you haven't slept well, if you haven't gotten fresh air today, if you're dehydrated, if you've had too much coffee, all of those things influence how we greet any of these stressors or some of those physiological states like fear, overwhelm, you could say, or stress or anxiety or any of those kind of things. So just looking after yourself and taking time to. When you're busy on a hamster wheel, it's hard to take time off. But again, uh, Stephen Covey's seven habit, sharpen the saw. Taking time out for yourself is feel selfish, but actually it's how you can better serve other people as well. And maybe it's the right, maybe it's the right thing despite being busy. So much wisdom in that one short response, Philip. And there's something you, I picked up on at the very beginning of your answer to that question and it was the idea of maybe this little negativity bias that we all carry around. It's a known cognitive bias that we retain a stronger memory of the negative things that happen to us than of the positive things. And you're talking about dealing with overwhelm by focusing on actually whether that's a mantra or an affirmation. I'm a capable, competent leader who can make their way through times of adversity. 
I don't know what other little techniques you have to help people to tune back into that, that, that positivity, to tune back into all the things that we are actually capable of instead of all the messages that the world throws at us that you're going to fail, it's going to be a disaster and we ultimately catastrophize off the, the consequences of failure when actually it would serve us far more to focus on what we actually can do, what we actually are capable of, what our actual potential is and what the evidence is for our potential, all of those past successes. Have you any advice around that? Because that negativity bias, it's there. It's there as a protection mechanism. It's there, to, we're hard, it's hardwired into us for survival. But in this knowledge economy that we live in, it's probably not serving us in the way that it did when we, I don't know, lived in caves and had tigers coming for tea. It doesn't serve us, uh, but it's also useful information. And again, it's how we frame things. And I don't know if you're allowed to say the L word in corporate environments, but it's, it is actually an act of love, any fear that we experience, because it's to keep us safe. It's to keep us comfortable. So literally just reframing it as a self-love or information that it is an act of self-love changes how we greet it or our orientation towards it. We don't see it as this bad thing that we must get rid of. Because what happens to anything you push away when you get on stage, Camilla, it presents itself. It becomes a tick, it's a fidgeting, it's something that will bubble up. But actually, when you reframe what it's trying to do, take the information that maybe I do need to be careful, but careful does not mean stop. So again, reframe the message that it's not a reason to stop. I appreciate the fear. Again, I was nervous before this conversation, but nervous in my physiology is exactly the same physiology as excitement just with a different label so when we reframe these things towards like bright side you could say it totally changes how we're able to perform and how we show up and then how we influence and build trust with other people so if we go back to the four things you can control that's probably some of the physiology no it's not it, that's focus so the focus is what can i how can i reframe mm -hmm. some of these things and give it a different meaning even if i'm holding on to the same things in my mind the language that we use to describe it, I'm capable, I'm able, I'm able to solve this. Back to evidence from the past, like you said, a brilliant point around bounce back ability. What are you proud of? And sit with that question. Walk in the forest with that question and think of it often because that's very different to where have I messed up in the past? Two questions. Questions shift your attention. What does a purple elephant look like? Nobody was thinking of a purple elephant before I asked the question, but questions are powerful in shifting what you focus on. And then with physiology, it's really just water, less coffee, more fresh air, breathing, the coherent breathing to go from stress to kind of coherent is five in, five out, or at least the same rhythm in, same rhythm out. It makes a massive difference. When you're speaking, I'm doing it so that I settle my heart rate and I am able to be more coherent rather than if you watch the graph from stress to coherent, it's chaotic over here. You want to move to coherent, which is really smooth. And when this is smooth in your heart rate, you're better able to perform. You're better able to be resourced. You actually don't lobotomy uh, your brain, I think it's called in the chimp paradox, right? He says we nearly give ourselves our own lobotomy because our reptilian brain, which is triggered when it's stressful or fear, shuts off any connection to your pre prefrontal lobe. So you, you, you forget all the words that you were going to say. You forget all of these things that you meant to say. But actually, because literally, physiologically, your brain has split. The way it, what it needs is time. Time will allow that reptilian brain just to suppress slightly, but breathing during that will also allow that connection to be made and make that connection happen that little bit quicker. So again, it's one of the only things we can control, but paying attention to those four will make a massive difference. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it did. Oh my goodness, I, I love that. I absolutely love that because as a performance coach myself, as a public speaking coach myself, Look, these are these are it's one of the biggest barriers that people put in front of themselves for a performance. I stand in front of audiences almost every day of my life. There are days when I might stand in front of three audiences. I am so accustomed to standing in front of audiences. And every once in a while I get up and I think, I just need to be out of here. That threshold anxiety just rises and it always catches me off guard because I don't expect it. And that's when, look, you don't learn to dance. 10 minutes before the ball, you have got to have been building up these habits over time so that in a moment like that, where you're feeling like fight or actually I'm, I'm choosing flight right now, um, I'm out of here. 
if you've built up those habits, if you've developed those habits, that's when they will really serve you. And what I thought was really interesting about what you said there is, as I'm speaking to you now, as I'm asking a very long question, I haven't got to the question yet, um, you're telling me that you're breathing. So it's that unobtrusive that we can gain control of our physiology without anybody around us necessarily noticing. And funny that, you're breathing right now anyway, right? So we're breathing anyway, we may as well just slightly change the mm. breathing pattern to set us up to perform. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I talk, talk about the the emotions here being a little bit like those snow globes, you know, like at Christmas time. That's me shaking a snow globe, by the way. And yeah. your emotions are flying around like those little flakes of snow in the snow globe. And that's what breathing can do. Just bring that snow to the floor of the snow globe. I mean, this is absolute gold, Philip. There's so much here for anybody who is facing a stressful, evaluative situation. That could be. A presentation it could be a big pitch to launch your company it could be your next performance appraisal that leads to your next promotion it could be a conversation with um, peers in a different organization maybe you're trying to merge maybe you've got a really high stakes um, situation here so really what you're talking about is ways that you can manage your performance under under conditions of extreme stress yeah so there's like an iceberg um, of performance and if you imagine above the line, above the line is what you do. So how am I using my hands? That's a what do you do behavior. And above that is the results that you get from demonstrating these behaviors. But below the line is where the power is. That's where you're thinking, you're feeling, the emotion, and again, the physiology all underpin what you do. So therefore the results that you get. So when you tune into some of these things, it makes a massive difference to your ability to perform what you do that people can see and the impact that it has for the results. Um, and they're simple things. And if people want to read more about it, Coherence, The Secret Science of Brilliant Leadership by Dr. Alan Watkins. He does a really good TED Talk. It's in two parts. It's called Being Brilliant Every Day. And I had gone on a journey, uh, Camilla, uh, more or less like for my own research, I looked into two parts. One was mental health because of family kind of connections to that space. Uh, and I have a a desire to learn more about it and to be able to help and recognize these signs that show up because of a family member uh, kind of experiencing that. So I went on this wild goose chase just exploring anything got to do with kind of physiology, well-being, anything. But then I saw that there was this connection to performance when you bring in the physiology. So I studied as a personal trainer, a qualified kettlebell instructor, but it brought me home. And I said this to Dr. Alan Watkins when I talked to him. I came home to his work because it articulated scientifically everything I had banged into just out of curiosity. And I just love that. So mm -hmm. I'm like, eventually will be a friend of their company, which is what they call people working with them. Uh, and I'm trying to bring them into uh, the corporate world where I'm working because I think that they can change the performance of an industry or of like companies. Um, but they're a really, a really good book to recommend is that one coherence. And then that Ted talk series, there's two of them and you can see live on stage, somebody just balancing the breathing and their ability to perform, which is counting back in sevens under pressure in front of maybe, I don't know, 100, 200 people. So these things are proven and you can see it live in that TED talk. So it's a really good uh, kind of, if people are curious and have roughly 20 minutes, you get a really good insight into it. Well, that sounds fantastic. That sounds like a brilliant resource. And you've touched on something there that I think is interesting to all of us is the idea that um, there's so much information available to us now that potentially wasn't accessible. Social media has made so much accessible to us all. Sometimes it's where to where to go, where, where to look for that advice, or I'm struggling with this particular issue and I don't really know where to start. And you've really highlighted, I think, the value of a good coach in your life, somebody who is external to you, somebody who has invested in their own personal development, somebody who spends time studying, while well, you've talked about being a qualified um, fitness instructor there. I know that you've already invested in your um, coaching skills and that you continue to do that. So having all of that knowledge, you know, brought together as somebody who, as somebody who can support you on, on, a, on a journey, I think there's massive value to that because it's always a lot harder to see what's going on for ourselves than it is to see it for another person and to have a qualified coach come into your life with all of that experience and expertise and know-how. I mean, talk to me about, you know, maybe somebody that you've worked with where 
there were results that were particularly unexpected. Yeah, and maybe just because there's a couple of analogies around coaching as well. Like I cannot see the back of my head. So that's why I need something like a mirror to be able to see it. And that's what a coach mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. uh, fish are last to discover water. And um, so when you see images of fish bowls, uh, they don't know that they're in water. So again, we see what we see, but we don't know that other people see something very differently. Um, like I've worked with many, Camilla, and I think it, it, the other thing about coaching as well is maybe just the balance between, yes, I have answers. Yes, I'm qualified. Yes, I've done the work on myself. But it's also about resourcing or equipping this person to own and hold their stuff. Because I have answers, but actually what I try to offer people that I coach is questions because it's their answers, it's their life. And if I tell you to do something, you might move away from it because you resent being told what to do. Whereas if you are allowed the space to come up with that for yourself and then maybe some really kind of poignant or useful kind of iterations to that based on some of my experience or other coaches' experiences, that can really fine tune and accelerate that development to a much greater degree. So maybe just to balance the tell, ask uh, kind of thing with mm. coaching that I'm trying to navigate for myself all the time mm. uh, because I read, because I care about this stuff so much. But for example, I work with a COO in a company who's trying to balance home life and work and with the chaos of uh, like daily running a business that has, I don't know, however many staff, but just the work was eventually, actually I need to focus on myself then I'm better able to balance the two, the work and the home. And then when I'm in a good state or a good place myself, I'm better able to interact with and give these things my best. So that was actually the work for this person. Another example is somebody running events and having to navigate the chaos of COVID over the last two years. Their business is in person. Their business is weddings. Their business is in um, that kind of thing. And I'm working with him on just again, navigating your relationship to stress, how you're better able to hold that in you so that it doesn't come across to the people that you're interacting with, both let's say event organizers, but also then the musicians and the people that this person has working with them. So like there are a couple of examples, but as well as that, I, I seem to be attracting a lot of personal trainers because they pay attention to the physiology and they're also trying to move or improve the mindset of people as they're making these changes. So I try to equip personal trainers with some of these kind of coaching models or ways of interacting around the mindset uh, so that they're better able to serve and help other people. And my, my thing on my wall is I want to be able to help other people shine their light brighter. And if people are doing that to help other people, but they're absolutely the people that I want to be working with because then the impact is that little bit greater. Hence, I wanted to work with leaders. Philip, it's been amazing. I can't believe that we've been talking for nearly half an hour. And as you're talking, I'm really reminded of that Wayne Dyer quote. When you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. And that's really what we've been talking about. It's the power of your mind to change outcomes. Philip, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, to all of you listening and watching, and for those of you perhaps watching on replay, um, if you enjoyed today's session, well then please do stay in touch with me, Camilla Long. Um, you can see my company uh, web address at the bottom of the screen. Um, please do hop on there and have a little look around. There are tons and tons of resources there to help you if, if you find yourself in stressful, evaluative situations, if you would like to communicate for impact within the workplace. There is just so much there that we've built up over the years that I hope will support you on your personal journey. Um, Bespoke Communications, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can follow my company on LinkedIn. Please do reach out to me personally on LinkedIn if you'd like to connect. Philip, I would love if you would share maybe how we could connect with you or how we can stay in touch with you. I know you and I are connected on LinkedIn, but I think I'm missing a trick because it seems to me like your Instagram profile is probably the place to go. Uh, balance between the two. So Philip Brady on LinkedIn, Philip Brady Coaching on Instagram uh, and Facebook and philipbradycoaching.com. Uh, but don't forget to subscribe, Camilla, to your uh, YouTube channel as well, right? People Fantastic. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> That's the collaboration right there. Well, look, I've just had the most gorgeous comment come in as we come to the end. And I think this summarizes how I'm feeling about the chat that we've had over the last half an hour. So Julianne says, best 30 minutes I've had in the last few months. Time to dust and start growing. On that note, thanks for listening, everyone. And Philip, thank you so much for, for joining me today. It's an honor.
that 